Well, <clears throat> I'm trying to remember when I first, uh, first met John. And although I'm not quite sure, I'm pretty sure that one day, <clears throat> we, were, we were already in Yorktown Heights. We had moved from the Lamb Estate. So I think that means it was already around 1961, or thereabouts. I was in my office, and the door opened, and John, of course I didn't know who it was, came in. And he started talking to me, I would say, about everything. Okay, It wasn't about any one thing. And I really didn't know uh, whether I was talking to someone who seemed to know everything or whether he was just, you know, crazy, and, you know, really. Uh, I pretty soon concluded that he really had a lot to say, although it was hard to understand it. Right? And I think that uh, whether it was in that meeting or one you know, shortly thereafter, he came in with some probability problem, which he wanted me to solve. <clears throat> now, of course, uh, a lot of people who know me don't realize that I actually was a research mathematician for a very long stretch of time. Okay? Now, through some remarkable miracle, I was able to. It wasn't a particularly easy problem, but I was just kind of lucky it was a problem that happened to yield to a particular technique. So John was very pleased with that. And I think that helped to, to start us off in the right direction. Well, I don't know if it was remarkable, but it was different. You know, John didn't waste a lot of time on preliminaries. He just started right in, you know. And, you know, he's, he's always been that way. And, you know, one of the great things about John is his intense interest in what he's doing. And, uh, you know, that's why he acts that way. And you get used to that very quickly, and you understand very quickly, you know, that this, uh, this guy thinks. Not everyone does. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk a little bit about... Um what you think are perhaps his greatest strengths as a researcher or as a person? Well, John knows an awful lot. Well, first of all, John does think. He thinks for himself. Uh, he doesn't... He isn't satisfied, as far as I can tell, until he himself understands it. He won't repeat the conventional wisdom about, you know, uniprocessors, multiprocessors, any subject, right? He won't repeat it till he understands it. And he's thought for so long and so hard about computers. And if you add to that his, you know, tremendous natural intelligence, you have um, a very unusual combination. I think, you know, the, I think the very best people have a lot of natural intelligence. But if you add to that literally decades of thinking more or less day or night about the subject matter, and working at it, then you get something that's unique. You get a degree of understanding of the big picture and all the little parts, both. That is, um, is absolutely uh, extraordinary. And that's what, uh, that's the way John is. Okay. We met in 61, approximately. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you, were you his direct manager no, 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 no. I was, a, I was a math researcher in the math department. I think John wasn't uh, in the math department at all. I don't think I was uh, either managing, I may have been managing at that time, for people. Or, you know, or maybe it was even... The notion that I was John's manager because he's a fellow is even less true for John than for most fellows. First of all, most fellows don't profit very much from having a manager, except that, you know, that their pay goes up, you know, because someone has to take care of that. But uh, John, even uh, less so. I wouldn't presume to guide John on computers. I mean, John might, John and I have some pretty exciting discussions about computers. And he might come to me because he's 
frustrated that such and such an idea, which is clearly right, and it usually is, isn't happening at the kind of pace that he would like it to have. And we had endless discussions of that type, okay, but managing John in the traditional sense wouldn't, wouldn't even begin to make sense. Actually, he, he might make a better manager for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, he, he didn't call me a lot at night, but he... Uh, my remark wasn't so much that... Uh, I w when talking about John's sort of working day and night, I didn't mean so much that he'd call me a lot at night, he would occasionally. But that it was just clear from talking to him and when he described what he's been doing that basically uh, he's thinking computers all the time. I don't think the point is so much day and night, you see, because what I've observed uh, in these matters is that the important thing is to be thinking about it all the time. In other words, you can have one person sitting at a desk and uh, they appear to be working, but in fact they're thinking about their work some, they're thinking about something else some or whatever. On the other hand, people who are really into their work, uh, they tend to think about it, either consciously or unconsciously, all the time. And I certainly had the experience during my research career with a small R. Uh, I used to think pretty continuously. And, you know, I'd wake up in the morning with a whole lot of things done. Okay, so I think there's a lot of difference between people who uh, really are constantly thinking, building up knowledge, assimilating facts, imp looking at things eight different ways. Even if that doesn't pay off right then, you keep building a mental picture of the subject. What's possible, what isn't, what worked, what you tried. That's just what you, that gives you a tremendous advantage. And I just know that John always was, th was thinking that way, either consciously or unconsciously. I mean, he never said that, but I know from dealing with him and from seeing many other researchers. It's not, I, I don't think it's too hard to do that, although perhaps others would disagree, but I think that uh, I'm reluctant to do it only for the following reason. First of all, name the most important contribution, I think, which is the risk, what is now called the risk, we used to call 801 architecture. The reason I don't particularly like doing it is that John made so many contributions that picking one uh, very much understates the things he's done, plus you'd have to add to that a tremendous list of things he's influenced. So I don't really like characterizing John, say, as the person who invented risk, but that characterization would be enough to make any other person famous. Talk about some of those other th ways that he's contributed. Well, he's a tremendous uh, contributor to optimizing compilers. Right? I'm not sure I can actually, you know, give a long list of, of specifics without thinking back. But John just was in on everything, stimulating people. You know, he worked extensively with Andy Heller. He worked with, uh, was it Ashok Chandra? I'm not quite sure which. Uh, uh, you know, all the good people, and they all found it uh, very enlightening. And he helped, uh, you know, he used to give me his opinions on a lot of things. Uh, he told me the Josephson program would never work, and he was right. But he sure saw it before I did. Oh, well, we had a review. I invited him to the review because I wanted to see what he thought. And that, that's what he said. It was already pretty late in the program, but, but uh, you know, it was useful input to me. I, you know, whenever I thought about the program, I thought John can't exactly say why, but he doesn't think it'll ever happen. That was part of what went through my mind whenever I thought about it. Well, I think the things that have made John uh, successful and you know, if this is a little repetitious, I can't help it. Is first of all, he, he's got tremendous intelligence. Second, he thinks day and night about computers and works on them. I'll tell you, if you start with someone with tremendous natural intelligence and he thinks about something day and night for 30 or 40 years, I'll tell you, 
and he has enthusiasm and cares, so his mind is constantly at it. That's going to be a success. You know, the world is full of people, first of all, who don't have that degree of intelligence. They don't have that degree of enthusiasm. They think about something spasmodically, and they're not in the... I mean, they cannot contribute in the way that a person like John can. And those, I think, are the fundamental reasons. Because with all that work, I mean, where does insight come from? All right? you, you tell me how much insight a person, uh, a normal American person, has about the best way to, t to cook Turkish food. I'll tell you, none. Don't know what it is to begin with. Right? Insight comes from experience and thought about it so that you understand it in a way you may not even understand, but you understand it, okay? Now, you take someone with great intelligence and they think about something day and night for 40 years or 30, whatever it happens to be. Believe me, they'll have insight. And John is a super case of that. And there aren't that many people like that. Right? Well... <clears throat> This may be more than you want to know about the risk. I, I want to know. That's yeah, what I'm asking. Yeah. Or perhaps I should say, you know, if I start at the beginning of my recollections about the 801, right, that may be more than anyone wants to know about it. Right? Because the first, uh, the first time I ever heard about this thing was uh, right after we had the, the funeral march for the, uh, the CX project. You don't know about that, right? And who does? Right? But <clears throat> we ran a study, and I think this was when Jack Bertram was head of the technology staff. We were thinking about the CX, the Central Exchange, as a business, which IBM might design or build equipment for because we could see that with the advance in semiconductor technology that that central switch business was going to change drastically. And research ran a study on how to design such a thing, and in it designed a computer for that purpose. And that thing was run by Joel Bernbaum. And I think we had a pretty good switch, and we talked to some companies uh, abroad about uh, being a partner with them. But for reasons not connected with the technical merits of this thing, it never flew. And one day, I remember I went over to Armonk and talked to Gil Jones, who at that time I think was running the World Trade Organization. And Gil had just come back from abroad where he'd been talking to various governments and companies about this possibility. And after listening to Gil, I came to the conclusion it was never, never going to fly, for reasons completely un unconnected with its technical merits. Having much more to do with the companies having their own set of suppliers, and they were not likely to train. So I came back, and after thinking a little bit, I said, we might as well kill this thing. So we killed it, and we had kind of a farewell lunch or dinner, I don't remember which for it. And. Um, so the people were thinking, and Joel Bernbaum was saying, what do we do next? The next thing I remember in the sequence of events is that George Radin popped up in my office and said that they were going to do, they wanted to run a project to design uh, a CPU. And he kind of outlined to me a little bit about it. This is what eventually became the first 801. And I was very cool to this because he didn't name any numbers. I said, George, what's the use? If you can you know, refine this stuff and make something that runs 20% better, it's not going to really do us any And he said, it isn't 20%. I said, what is it? And he said, well, it's more like factors of two or three. So I said, gee, if you can do that, I'm interested. Yeah. That was the beginning of the 801 project as I remember. And I was very surprised, believe me, I didn't think that there were factors of two or three just in CPU architecture. 
Well, then, you know, as it went along, I learned more about, you know, where this all was coming from. And uh, I don't remember very specific conversations with John, but of course he was in and out of that the whole time. And uh, God, I don't know how many studies we ran. Then, of course, we built the prototype machine. Endless studies of trying to show that this thing did run 2 or 2.5 or 3 or 3.5, depending on what problems you fed it, faster than the equivalent ordinary machine and so on. And we built the prototype and so forth. And that just went on and on. And of course, uh, I was a part of that all the way through, trying to get various parts of IBM to adopt it, which was hard because they were all committed to their own machines. And um, there was a notion which persisted for a long time that the way to get this thing going was that the 801 design was so much faster than the ordinary that you could build an 801 and then, with variations either in hardware or software, make it impersonate whatever the machine was going to be, really, that you, know, you inherited from the past. And at one time, all the mid-range systems were supposed to be 801s in disguise, but that program collapsed. That was, uh, I forget what its name, Fort Knox, I think, was it then. Okay. And then Vic Goldberg, you won't believe this, but there was a moment when Vic Goldberg was the head of the division uh, that had its, uh, I'm not quite sure what its name was at that moment because uh, it was variously the typewriter division and so on that had its headquarters, uh, not its headquarters, but did its development in Austin. And um, Leonard Liu was his chief of staff, and Frank King was the next person in line under him. Okay. And we somehow managed to sell that trio on the notion of using the ROMP chip, which was a cut-down 801, as the basis of a workstation product. It was in contention then with the Motorola 68000, etc. The ROMP chip has it, its own weird history, which was was originally aimed at the display writer, believe it or not. Yeah. That's why it was cut down. The R-O-M-P stands for Research O-P, that was the typewriter division, Office Product, M, have I got that right? R-O, no. Research O-M-P. Research Office Products Microprocessor. Believe it or not, that the original thing was supposed to be for, you know, a display writer or something like that. And they decided it was still so powerful, they decided to make the first workstation. Of it. And that was our first 801 product, but it wasn't a full-blown 801. So at each stage then, yeah. it was you that was the one... Well, I, I was certainly really pushing hard. very hard, and, and I also, of course, even when... The, the, you know, our, the, the, what do we call it now? The S6000. RS6000, RS6, okay. As that was going along its rocky path, there was lots of contention about that, and I was constantly negotiating to keep it alive. I mean, it had many supporters. It also had many people who didn't believe that, that, that the speed advantage was worth the total incompatibility and everything else. So it was a contest all the way through, but I'm awful glad that we're finally, finally there. But we owe an awful lot to John. First of all, John made the, the first design. But John, but the thing we have now is a second generation risk. And John was the moving spirit behind that. Okay, so he didn't just do it once, he did it twice. And, you know, we can, those of us who by that time were in management and struggling with this thing all the way through, we can think about our contribution, but there wouldn't be anything to fight about if John hadn't done that. Wouldn't be anything there. Now, this thing, of course, in the end has become much bigger than IBM because 
you know, most of the other workstation companies already have risk machines just as we do. So risk has gone out and become a major thing in the world. For anyone but John, that's a, more than a career's accomplishment. But, you know. Right. Right. Uh, do you have any stories that you can tell us about off hours, after hours? Or well, I'm not there. I'm not really the authority on John after hours. I think that uh, for that, I refer you to Andy Heller. I would have referred you to Jack Bertram, except for his untimely death. The, I only heard about most of that uh, secondhand. However, the secondhand stories have the characteristic that they seem to mix uh, equal quantities of drink and computers. Okay, that as far as I can tell, that you know, when they were in bars, they were talking computers in bars. And I believe it. Well, I will tell you that Andy Heller swears that every bar they've been in, they've got diagrams carved in the... Yeah, uh, the, I think know, that's it. The bar all the way yeah. along. We should go and collect those and make yeah, sure that's, found them. Yeah, but that's the way you make progress. Yeah. Do you have a favorite memory of John Kirk? Well, I think the picture, when I think of John, I think of him busting into my office the first time. I just had a feeling that this was not quite your ordinary person. Maybe you'll tell that one again, because now we've got the shirt straight and so on. All right. Okay. The first time I saw John, he, I was in my office, you know, doing work on, I guess, probably integer and linear integer programming. Um, and uh, my feeling, it can't be right, he probably knocked on the door. My feeling is the door opened, and this person, who later turned out to be John Conk, walked in and started talking to me about all kinds of mathematical things, many of which I knew nothing about, but he appeared to know a lot about. Okay? It was hard for me to sort out exactly what was going on. Okay? And, and whether this guy just knew everything, because I don't think I'd ever ran into anyone who talked about so many different topics, or what really was going on. And after a while, I realized, by talking to him about some of the things I knew, that he really did know what he was talking about. It's just that his style of conversation, you know, he jumped from one thing to another, and it didn't unroll in a particularly uh, coherent fashion. But he was always saying something. It's just that he had to learn how to understand it. That was my first impression of John, and it was um, perhaps the most vivid, the one that remains in my mind. He came back to see me, I think it was on a separate trip, because for some reason or other he thought I could solve a problem, I think in probability, that he wanted to work out. And by, I think, more luck than anything else, I was actually able to work it out, I think overnight or something. And I think that put me in, 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 in John's good graces, because he had some trouble getting it done. And so we went on from there. And I also remember, as a matter of fact, that he liked my work. Paul Gilmore and I had solved, had worked on the traveling salesman problem, and had actually worked out a, cure, a special case, not a particular problem, but a class of traveling salesman problem that might have some practical application, but had enough structure that they were actually um, solvable in a reasonable number of steps, and by a you know, well-defined algorithm which was bounded. And he was also quite interested in that. So we had sort of a mathematical friendship in those early, early years. And when I, you know, if you were to ask me what is my most memorable picture of John, I would say it's of his suddenly appearing in my office and starting to talk about everything. Everything at once. Mm -hmm.